We've arrived at Ginkakuji, which is one of the prettiest of all the temples and gardens in Kyoto. It's in the Tsukuyama style of hillside garden. A dramatic entry lined by tall hedges leads into another world, a lyrical dreamscape of ponds surrounded by gardens, dotted with statues, and linked together by exquisite bamboo railings that guide you along the very pleasant and calm footpaths. Try to arrive when it opens at 9 a.m. to enjoy its tranquility undisturbed by the busloads that are soon to come. The Japanese garden is a miniature and idealized view of nature, and this style of garden is meant for strolling, for moving around from one place to another, and as you go, there will be scenes revealed and then left behind. It's hide and reveal, appearing then disappearing. These gardens are not laid out straight and nor do they have a single focus. Instead, the paths are designed with curves and bends and they'll go up and down. It's made to look natural, but of course everything here is carefully designed. Ginkakuji is a Zen temple that represents the Higashiyami culture of the Muromachi period back in the 15th century. It was originally built as a retirement villa and gardens between 1460 and 1480 by Ashikaga Yoshimasa, who arranged for his property to become this Zen temple after his death. The main structure is similar in design to that of Kinkakuji, another famous temple in Kyoto that was built by his grandfather. The temple is now associated with the Rinzai branch of Zen. Obviously, the best way to enjoy these gardens without crowds is come in the off season, as we are here in early December, which is really the perfect time to be in the gardens of Kyoto. You have the fall colors still lingering, and if you're here in the middle of the week, especially in early December, there's hardly anybody else around. If you're here on a typical busy day, there are going to be hundreds, maybe a thousand people in the garden. So that does make it a little difficult to get into that contemplative and meditative mood that the gardens are designed to foster. Instead, you'll have lots of people around. Some of them are shouting at each other. Others are waving their selfie sticks around, kids running past you. So it does provide a challenge if you're here in a busy time. There are a few steps to climb as you walk along the main path, but really it's not a strenuous walk. Just about anybody can do it. Anybody who's in normal condition, no problem, you'll love it. Railings are typically made with green bamboo to blend in with the scenery, providing an organic and clean appearance, while at the same time being functional to help you steady yourself and keep you from walking into the garden and then you can walk up the hill and gain some lovely views. The main pavilion is known as Ginkaku, the silver pavilion, because originally they were planning to cover its exterior in silver, but that never happened. Instead, the outside has had an unfinished appearance for the last 500 years, which illustrates one of the aspects of wabi-sabi quality. Wabi-sabi was developed as a Japanese worldview or aesthetic based on imperfection and the impermanence of life, deeply rooted in the Zen Buddhist philosophy. It's based on ideas that nothing is perfect or ever finished and nothing lasts forever. Some of the characteristics of that wabi-sabi aesthetic can be seen in the garden itself. They include asymmetry and irregularity, uh, simplicity, economy and austerity, modesty, and appreciation of the natural world. Understanding and accepting these concepts was viewed as an important step towards enlightenment, or satori. It's often summarized as wisdom and natural simplicity and flawed beauty. Of course, there are many more dimensions to this profound philosophy and various interpretations of it, such as the Mahayana Buddhist view of the universe, which cautions that genuine understanding cannot be achieved through words or language. It's more nonverbal. 
involving feelings and sensations. A variety of different moss cover most of the ground surface here, providing different shades and colors, and they like to display it with labels to let you know what varieties are found in the garden. These boxes display 48 different types. And notice the carefully tended sand garden. This is an example of that kare sansui style that we saw with the pebble garden back at Tofukuji at the Abbot's Hall. The garden is arranged in two sections. The upper terrace is in the style of a dry garden with stones and sand and no water. And the lower terrace is designed with changing views as you walk around the pond, very green and luxurious. The Buddhist temple gardens were designed for contemplation and meditation, not so much for recreation and fun and pleasure, although modern travelers understandably are really just walking around and enjoying the beautiful sights, not thinking so much about meditation and philosophy, but peaceful contemplation can certainly add more dimensions to your experience here in the gardens. Remarkable combination of styles of landscape architecture right here. This is definitely a place that you must visit, Ginkakuji. We're taking a stroll on the Philosopher's Path. It's just about one mile long and very pleasant. You go along this canal and there's gardens, there's private homes, there's a beautiful hillside and more of these lingering fall colors. There are some little benches scattered here and there where you could sit down if you wish. But really, it just takes about oh, half an hour to have a leisurely stroll along the Philosopher's Path. And it's a very good way to start the day because obviously this is open from sunrise if you want to come out here early in the day. It's a delightful one mile trail along this tiny canal with lush vegetation, especially tranquil at the beginning or end of day. Nice gravel walkway, and there's some paved sections of the walkway. A few locals out. Now, during the summer season, during the middle of the day, this is going to be a very crowded area, and it won't be very philosophical. But in this time, it certainly was. This was filmed during the first week of December, which had really pleasant weather. It was cool, but not cold. Here's a cat on a leash. So well-trained, he even knows where to go. Look at him lead the master across this little footbridge. That's a most unusual sight. Cat on a leash. It's a perfect place to walk your dog or play with them, especially a frisky dog like this one and his elderly owner who is acting like a little kid playing with his happy dog. Walking on the philosopher's path towards another temple is a good time to consider some ideas of Buddhism. After all, so much of Japan and the temples of Kyoto are Buddhist. Now, most Japanese people are not very religious. When they go to the temples and the gardens, it's really not so much on a religious or a philosophical pilgrimage. It's to see the beauties and they'll do some praying, some of them, while they're there, but it's really kind of secondary in Japan culture. They say that Japanese are born Shinto, they might have a Shinto wedding, and they're buried with a Buddha ceremony, and that's about it for the major religious events of their life. But the Buddhism philosophy is really an interesting and appealing one. And as we walk through this series of gardens here in the next few minutes of the program, I'll be describing the gardens and mixing in a little description of some of the basic principles of Buddhism too. This is Honen Inn, which is a good spot to visit early in the morning because it opens at 7 a.m. and it's free. So you don't have to worry about the gates being closed when you arrive here at Honen with images of the Buddha 
the Buddha, the enlightened one who lived in India around 500 BC, he established a philosophy of life which has evolved into one of the world's great religions. In fact, has taken on a life of its own and gone quite far beyond what the Buddha had envisioned. But the basic Buddhist beliefs come down to the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path and the Five Precepts. So as we stroll around, let's consider these Buddhist principles in this Buddhist temple garden. The Four Noble Truths start with the idea that life involves suffering. And there's a cause of this suffering which is ignorant craving and attachment. And there's a way out of the suffering to nirvana and liberation by following the Noble Eightfold Path. So Buddhism's Noble Eightfold Path is basically a way towards liberation and nirvana and peace and true happiness and true understanding of the way things really work. And it could be lumped together in three broad categories of developing your wisdom, your morality, and meditating. Specifically, the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddha gives you some guidance as to how you should live. Following right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and finally, right concentration. From Ginkakuji and Honan, we're traveling west a few blocks to another great temple with a beautiful garden and pond. Arriving at Heian Jingu. This is actually one of the newer temples in Kyoto, built at the end of the 19th century, and of course built in a very traditional style. This kind of architecture really dates back three, four, or even 500 years. This reproduction of an imperial palace was constructed in 1895, complete with shrines and a vast garden complex with ponds, islands, and a Chinese-Japanese style of landscaping. And it's a very large temple complex with some beautiful gardens out in the back. There's always well-tended paths through the gardens. You notice all of the colors in the trees. We were quite fortunate to be catching the tail end of the fall season. Even though it's the first week of December, the weather was fairly moderate, and generally the colors do linger into the early part of December. Often you have a pond or several ponds like this with pretty reflections of the vegetation. The temples have wonderful wooden architecture, and yet the garden all around probably is even more of an interesting attraction than the buildings themselves. One reason this grand temple and gardens were created in the late 19th century was in reaction to Kyoto being replaced as the capital of Japan by Tokyo. For a thousand years, Kyoto had been the capital of the country. And when the capital was moved to Tokyo in 1868, it caused some decline in the prosperity and mood of the city, and this temple was constructed 30 years later as a response of the city to revitalize. The garden all around the pond is 30,000 square meters in size and divided in four sections with a variety of birds such as kingfishers and large falcons. Here's a gardener out in a boat reaching some of the areas that are on islands in the middle of the pond. Afterwards, you might take a walk through the public park in front towards that huge metal torii, the biggest in town, and consider a visit to the National Museum of Modern Art with its large collection of paintings and ceramics. The Kyoto Municipal Museum of Art is also just behind. Nanzenji is a vast complex with numerous sub-temples, gardens, and shrines sprawling up the hillside, including another pebble garden, hiking trails, 
waterfalls and a mountain glen. Nanzanji was bestowed the title of first temple of the land and is considered by many to be the most famous and important Zen temple in the world. It's designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Nanzen Inn is a smaller sub-temple behind the main Nanzenji, and it's one of the oldest and yet one of the least well-known sub-temples, perhaps because it's slightly hidden away. It started out as a retirement villa for the Emperor Kameyama. Perhaps the main feature of Nanzen Inn is the small pond and quiet moss garden surrounded by momiji trees and azaleas. And the pond has several tiny islets, including one that's shaped like the character for heart. The pond garden was built in the strolling style, representing the late Kamakura period, and retains an image of beautiful scenery surrounded by a deep forest with an exceptional atmosphere of peace and tranquility. It was designated a national historic and scenic site in 1923. It's a very small garden that you could walk around in five minutes and exit, but it's so pretty that it's certainly worth stopping and standing and enjoying each of the views from its own particular angle, which of course is the way these gardens are designed. They're strolling gardens, so the idea is to walk along with your eyes open and stop here and there, look this way, look that way, and enjoy all the different views as they unfold. Sometimes you'll get lucky and come across a beautiful scene like this that just has a strong personal attraction for some reason. You just can't take your eyes off it. You, you can't leave it. You just have to stop and look and walk one way, walk around the other way, come back again, and just drop everything and enjoy this vista. The rocks, of course, are not carved rocks. They're natural rocks, but they're carefully placed into each spot so that it looks natural, and yet it's been shaped and cultivated in an ideal way. The temple was first established in the year 1291 by the Emperor Kamayama, who built it on the site of his previous palace. It's also the headquarters of the Nanzenji branch of Rinzai Zen. Typical of the old wooden temple buildings, it was destroyed by fire several times and finally rebuilt in 1597 and then expanded over time with the addition of more gardens and sub temples. And then we walked out on the main grounds of the temple of Nanzen and came across what looked like something from ancient Rome, a large aqueduct. The canal called Sosui is a channel that brings water from Lake Biwa passing the Nanzenji temple and right on into Kyoto City. The construction of the canal was pretty recent. It was begun in 1881 and finished in 1890 and it was primarily to bring water to the city and also it added some hydroelectric power and provided irrigation water and turned water wheels for spinning cotton. Of course there's no connection to Rome. This is a Japanese aqueduct. They were experts at irrigation of the rice terraces and funneling water from one area to another. And even though this aqueduct is not ancient, it has a historic character with the brick construction and graceful arches that makes it blend in beautifully with the temple grounds. The temple complex reached its maximum size in the period between 1616 and 1868 when it grew to contain 62 sub-temples spread over nearly 400,000 square meters of garden area. But this ended during the Meiji period after 1868, when Shintoism began to replace Buddhism as the dominant belief of Japan. By then, the temple was partly demolished, leaving only the nine sub-temples that we have today. The tallest structure is the Sanman Gate, which is a gateless gate, typical of the Zen, and you can climb a staircase up to the top for a view. The building called 
Kuri has a geometrical beauty produced by white walls and black building materials and the lines of the roof, so characteristic of the Zen style of architecture. When you get to Kyoto, be sure to visit Nanzenji Temple. And while you're there, look around behind the aqueduct for the little pond, the gardens of Nanzen Inn. Go ahead and spend the extra yen to get in there. It's definitely worth it. One of the prettiest little ponds you'll ever see. This is part of our series on the temples and gardens of Eastern Kyoto, the Higashiyama district. And also we'll take you downtown in some of our other videos. Chio In is the main temple of the Jodo sect of Japanese Buddhism, which has millions of followers throughout the country and 7,000 other temples, but Chiyoin is the main temple where this branch of Buddhism was created by Honen way back in the 12th century. The main entrance Sanman Gate is the largest wooden gate in Japan, 24 meters tall or 79 feet, and dates back to the early 1600s. The vast temple grounds include 106 buildings and several beautiful gardens will take you walking through. We were fortunate to be able to enter the Miedo, the main building of the temple complex. Inside, a regular service was taking place with the Shomyo, which is the melodic chanting of a sutra. We'll show you more of that at the end of the video. There is no charge for walking around in the temple grounds, but if you want to enter the gardens, you do pay a small fee. You can pay separately for one or for both gardens. The two gardens at Chiyoin are smaller than what you'll find at many of the other temples of Kyoto, but the gardens are quite lovely and we're going to walk you through them. The Hojo Garden is designated by Kyoto City as a famous scenic spot. It's a garden designed around a pond. We're enjoying it with the remains of the autumn foliage of early December. You can also come in the spring and see the cherry blossoms or you'll experience the fresh greenery in the summertime. It's a very small garden that you could walk around in five minutes and exit, but it's so pretty that it's certainly worth stopping and standing and enjoying each of the views from its own particular angle, which of course is the way these gardens are designed. They're strolling gardens, so the idea is to walk along with your eyes open and stop here and there, look this way, look that way, and enjoy all the different views as they unfold. As you stroll quietly along on these curved paths, the landscape and scenery and the garden is revealed to you at each turn, at each curve. And then that same sight disappears as you continue walking. The reveal, the surprise, linger a moment for appreciation and contemplation, look around, and then move beyond. It's all part of this magical experience of the strolling garden. Much different than a garden where you're just standing in one spot at a lookout point, perhaps, looking out at a view. The strolling garden is a totally immersive experience. The cemetery on the edge of the gardens is densely packed with burials of ashes of the faithful. The central premise of the Jodo sect was that the Buddhist deity Amida had created a paradise that anyone could enter after death. One needed only to recite the name of Amida in faith. Jodo literally means pure land and refers to Amida's paradise, and this new sect of Buddhism gave common people the same opportunity for salvation as priests or aristocrats, and that's why it became very popular among the masses. As a couple of monks head on in for some quiet meditation, this garden has a rich variety of features ranging from the cemetery to smaller temple buildings, the staircases. Be careful now. You don't want to be looking at your camera while you're walking down steps like that. We'll be leaving the temple soon, but first appreciating more of the shrines. One of Japan's most 
breathtaking statues is next door in a wooden sub-temple, a serene golden Buddha 10 feet high. Designed for prayer and meditation, one of the prettiest Buddha statues we've ever seen. This is part of our series on the temples and gardens of eastern Kyoto, the Higashiyama district, and also we'll take you downtown in some of our other videos. Be sure to look for them in our collection.